A lot of times when we talk about issues in Portland, we're focusing on the city as a whole. But tonight, let's zero in on one particular area, Old Town. Their crisis on the streets is impacting the entire neighborhood. We are feeling everything, whether it's protests, wildfire smoke, extreme heat, um, the trash, the noise, the drugs, the criminal activity. We are living it as much as any other person on the street of Old Town is living it. Do you feel forgotten about by the people in this city? I just am not convinced there's an urgency to addressing what is happening. How urgent is this? Now, it is extremely urgent. Here's the story. All right, and I'm Dan Haggerty. Thanks for being with us on this Tuesday. All the ways to communicate with us at the bottom of your screen. We want to hear from you, so please email us at the story at kgw.com. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram or use Twitter and the hashtag HeyDan. Let's get started. So tonight's big story is Old Town. Have you been down there lately? Do you know why they call it Old Town? I want to read a quick description from Travel Portland. This is the one that's online right now. The city's oldest neighborhood is filled with surprises from authentic Chinese restaurants, tea houses, and a city block sized traditional garden. Portland's original downtown is a bustling entertainment district and streetwear shopping hub. That's one way to put it. Yeah, it is full of surprises. I'll admit that. But I think you're missing a few details. For instance, Old Town currently is nothing like that at all and is actually a total disaster. Its streets are lined with tents and homelessness and suffering and addiction, mental illness and violence. The businesses are struggling, not just to stay open, but to keep their workers safe. Same goes for some of the nonprofits that are down there. And some of the people who live in that area or commute through there are terrified or are becoming victims of some of this violence. Now, we've been wanting to do a story on Old Town for some time now because we know it is less of a bustling entertainment district and more like a humanitarian crisis with lives on the line. And I'm not, under, I'm not overstating that. Over the summer, just a few examples here. Over the summer, an out-of-town visitor, a tourist, was chased by a woman and stabbed in the street. The attack was random, unprovoked, and it happened in the middle of the day. Or this story, in late August, when two women and a boy, a six-year-old, were attacked by a woman with a hatchet and an axe while they waited in line for pizza. Or all of the shootings that we've seen down in that area, like this one we reported on, when five people were shot at a vigil in Old Town, while those people were down at the vigil remembering their friend who was killed after being shot in Old Town. In the last year, there have been five homicides in Old Town. The year before, there were zero. There have been 20 shootings over the past year in Old Town, more than twice than the number that we saw there the year before. And the vast majority of those, 70% of them, were just in the last six months. And let me give you an example of just one of those shootings, like the vigil shooting that I mentioned just a moment ago, a drive-by that was caught on, her, on hotel surveillance camera. I mean, what kind of gun that is. Uh, and that counts, all those shots, that counts as one shooting in the books. That is the real Old Town. Or should I say Chinatown, right? That's the other name that it goes by because of its rich history of Chinese influence. Remember what Travel Portland said? The authentic Chinese restaurants, tea houses, and a city block sized traditional garden. Well, that traditional garden is a treasure in this city, or at least it's supposed to be. This is footage from the KGW vault when Lan Su opened 21 years ago. Everything inside was shipped from China. This was a huge deal. It's about as authentic as you can get in the US. Everyone in town got all dressed up and the city bragged about it during the grand opening. It's a whole different experience when you're here alone and the lighting is illuminating certain parts of trees, certain parts of rocks. Uh, things like that. It's just a uh, very tranquil. It, it's, it transports you to another uh, realm, really. This garden has surpassed anything that we thought it was going to be. Yeah, it was a big deal. Our story featured former mayor Bud Clark walking around with a camcorder in one hand and a glass of wine in the other hand. Check him out. This project was built on a full city block, a very valuable city-owned land, and a city 
full of politicians who claim to respect and honor the Pacific influence on our culture here from the generations of Asian immigrants and their relatives. But 21 years and that grand opening was a long time ago. Things have changed. The executive director of Lan Su sent out this letter to everyone involved with the garden explaining that the situation there is dire. I'll let her explain the details. This is Elizabeth Nye. I have had staff in the last week assaulted. I have had staff in their cars chased with uh, people chasing after them with metal pipes. We had somebody die on the streets right next to Lan Su. We have had gunshots. Um, all of this is too much to ignore and not address. We will do what is necessary for us to keep our staff, our visitors, and our volunteers safe. So what does that mean? They're going to do whatever they have to do. Well, what it's meant so far is that they've had to hire private security. And then they've already had to increase the patrols of that security because things were worse than they even thought they were. They've been partnering with nonprofits to clean up the sidewalks outside. The city isn't doing it. They are. The workers who work there and the volunteers who work there have had to use the buddy system if they want to use public transit. You can really get a sense of the garden's tranquil influence, can't you? They sent us some of the most recent incident reports from the past, the past few weeks. I want to read a couple of them for you here. A staff member was verbally threatened by a homeless woman. A staff member was physically assaulted on their way to work. A staff member was chased leaving work. A tent caught fire outside. Someone was publicly using drugs in the front plaza. A man was found dead in his tent. A trash can was stolen outside. And they sent us a video of a woman using a rock tied up in her sleeve to smash the front door. Oh, that's not gonna take very long, yep. I mean, it's one thing when you start to become numb, it's like, oh yes, oh my gosh, there was another attack, there was another forced entry. And then you just start thinking about one after another after another. It's, it's enough, it's just too much. Do you feel forgotten about by the people in this city? That's a great question. I don't um, know that we are forgotten about. I feel like people see what is happening. I just am not convinced there's an urgency to addressing what is happening. How urgent is this? Now, it is extremely urgent. So with that urgency, what is the city doing in Old Town? I'm told the mayor's office organizes a weekly program, a problem solvers meeting with the leaders down in that area, which does sound promising, but I hear that the only things they're really focusing on are things that the city considers to be quote unquote solvable problems. Uh, one of the examples I was given was an issue with parking. In fact, when I asked Elizabeth Nye about those meetings, she got a little bit upset. If I, if I gave you the power as police chief or as the mayor, like, what, what do you think? Do, you need, do we need more police down here? Do we need more resources to get people care? Do we need... I don't know. It? I'm going to tell you something. Some of the conversation has shifted to everybody knows what the problems are, so don't come to me unless you have solutions. That's what we're being told. Well, I don't have the solutions. My job is to run Lawn Sioux. Your job is to show up and make our city safe so that we can do that. And all of this in a place that's supposed to bring calm and tranquility to our city. The contradiction is glaring. And just so you fully understand what the people down there are dealing with, many of those people who work there are volunteers. Most of them are older people. Many of them are Chinese Americans. And this pandemic has made things especially tense for them. If you can believe it, they are still facing racism surrounding the coronavirus. People are actually paying money to go to a Chinese garden and then yell racist slurs at the workers there. And anti-maskers are regularly throwing fits because they have a mask policy. The venue is outside, so people think they can go there and maybe not have to wear a mask, but it's hard to be socially distant. So they require them and people get mad and yell at those volunteers. Morale is at an all time low. And to be honest, there's no light on the horizon. Or, in other words, a bustling entertainment district that's full of surprises. All right, I want to get to a viewer question now. We've got a bunch of these over the past year. Lynn asked, so what happened to the elk 
that was removed. You know what she's talking about, the elk statue that used to live right in downtown Portland, kind of a staple down there. People knew it until it was damaged during last year's protests. A lot of people love that elk, so they want to know where it went and when it's going to be back. As for where it is, the Regional Arts and Culture Council has it in storage right now, except they won't disclose the exact location to us or to anybody else. It's apparently top secret. Maybe it's sitting next to the Ark of the Covenant. I don't know. As for when the statue will return, that's a little bit more complicated. See, last week, Portland's arts program manager told the Oregonian it's becoming more and more clear that the elk won't return until at least next summer. And that's apparently due to some bureaucracy and some red tape at City Hall, according to the newspaper. Yesterday, Portland's Historic Landmarks Commission held a public briefing all about this elk statue. A part of their discussion was about where it should go. Should it go back to the original place or should it be moved somewhere else? Before it was removed, the elk statue uh, sat on southwest Main, right between Chapman and Lounsdale uh, squares right in that little area. One idea is to move the elk into one of those two squares, so out of the street and into one of the green areas there. Another option is moving it down the street to the South Park blocks. So we're going to keep an eye on all of this and where it might end up. But again, sounds like we may not see the elk either way, no matter what, until at least next year. So, there's officially a new Oregon congressional map, which means that you might soon get a different representative in Congress than you've had for years. So, let's take a look at what's changing. And it turns out the Blazers have a better COVID vaccination rate than most other companies. And it's a way for me to protect myself and, and the people that I love when I do it. It's pretty simple. When the story continues. Welcome back. I was going through some uh, questions and comments during the break. Keep sending them in. The story at KGW.com is the best email. You can hit me up on Twitter using the hashtag HeyDan. I'll address a few later. I also want to tell you about our Hey Help campaign, as I do every night. This week, we are asking you to please consider donating to Street Roots. I know you're familiar with them. You should be. They're this, a nonprofit weekly newspaper sold by people experiencing homelessness to earn an income. They really help a lot of people out, and the journalism is good. If you want to help them, just hold the camera on your phone to the QR code on your screen. 
screen and it'll take you to a donation page. You can also go to kgw.com slash heyhelp to find a link. And this is a micro donation drive, so feel free to give any amount you want, no matter how small. All right, let's talk about vaccines. <clears throat> Now, if I asked you which company or organization had 100% staff fully vaccinated, what would you guess? Maybe a healthcare clinic or a hospital or something like that? Good guesses, right? But no, it's the Portland Trailblazers. The entire team, the whole roster, the operations staff, everybody fully vaccinated. To put that into perspective, only 79% of healthcare workers in Oregon are fully vaccinated right now. Not even 8 out of 10. That's according to the latest data from the OHA. So let's listen to Dame talk about why he got the shot. You know, I don't I'm not mad at people for, you know, saying I need to do my research or, you know, they got to take the, the steps that make them comfortable. Um, you know, but I, you know, I, I have a lot of people in my family that um, I'm tight with and that I spend a lot of time around. And, you know, I'm just not going I'm just not going to put their their health or their lives in danger because, you know, I want to hold a a big research when, you know, as a kid, I had to get shots my whole life. And before I went to college, I had to get shots and I couldn't tell you one thing about any of them. So if, if it's something that, you know, I've had people in my family actually die and people actually lose, lose their lives to it, like I'm not, and it's a way for me to protect myself and, and the people that I love, I'm gonna do it. You know, it was, it was pretty simple. Okay, on that note, let's count some vaccines. More than 2.8 million Oregonians have gotten at least their first dose of a vaccine. That's more than 66% of the state's entire population. Everybody, that includes even kids under 12 who can't get the vaccine yet. In Washington, more than 5 million people have gotten at least their first dose, which works out to be about 67% of the state's entire population, including, including kids. Now, if you've been watching us every night, you might be thinking, wait a minute, Washington. Those numbers, those don't look quite right. They look way lower than what we were showing just last week. And we noticed that too. So we asked the CDC about it. Here's what they told us on September 23rd, 2021 data review and reporting adjustments resulted in a decrease in the number of vaccine doses administered for Washington state of 473,191 doses. The adjustments are the result of updates to how pharmacies report data to CDC and or the jurisdictions. So basically, they realized they were over reporting a bunch of doses, which I feel like they should have just said the way they answered it was very complicated. I liked our way better and they've corrected that. Now, we've been spending a lot of time talking about redistricting all right, for weeks now. And uh, as you've been waiting to see what's going on, we now got to see Oregon's new maps that they have passed. Well, they uh, have. So let's take a closer look really quickly, because depending on where you live, they might change who represents you in Congress. Here's a look at Oregon's new congressional map with that new 6th district. Now, this map doesn't go into effect until 2022. So whoever, whoever wins those congressional elections in 2022 will be the people representing these new districts. Nothing happens yet. But I want to start with Oregon's 4th district, Southwest District Southwest Oregon, which Peter DeFazio, DeFazio has represented since 1987. Yeah, 34 years. So some people have probably been voting for him your entire voting lives. And his district, like all the districts, has gotten a little bit smaller because they had to fit the sixth one in somewhere. So that means people who live north of Eugene and east of Corvallis won't actually be wrecked by DeFazio anymore if he wins re-election in 2022. Instead, you'll be part of Oregon's fifth district, which looks a lot different than before. This is the one Republicans have kind of had a problem with it because it goes from the Portland metro area across the Cascades and all the way to Bend. Right now, Kurt Schrader represents the 5th District. If he wins re-election, that means people in Bend would be represented by a Democrat. Republicans have represented Bend in Congress for the past 40 years, so this would be a huge change. Now, let's take a look at the new district boundaries in Portland. The old map splits the metro area into three districts, but now it's split into four. Notably, East and West Portland will be in different districts, except for a little chunk of Southeast. If you live on the West side right now, you're represented by Earl Blumenauer, but under the new map, your representative will be Suzanne Bonamici if she wins re-election, which she always has since 20, uh, 2012. And those of you who live in the southwest suburbs like Tiger, Tualatin, Sherwood, you'll be part of that new 6th district. So you'll get a brand new representative in Congress. 
Two people have already said that they are running for that seat. Loretta Smith, who's a former Multnomah County Commissioner. She lost to Dan Ryan for Portland City Council last year. And Derry Jackson, a former Portland School Board member who is also running. All right. I hope I didn't make that too complicated for you. Keep sending in your questions and comments. Try to address a few when we come back after this. But first, we're going to finish the story by heading six hours south of Portland on a little food trip to the coast. Welcome back. Just checking out some comments. We'll get to those in just a minute. But first, I want to talk about food. You know, it's dinner time. Maybe some of you have eaten already. I'm always hungry during this last bit of the show. I know there are a lot of foodies out there. And also a lot of people who think we spend a lot more, a lot, maybe too much time focused on Portland. So tonight, let's focus on one of the culinary delicacies of the southern Oregon coast, rockfish. Nina Melhoff went to Port Orford with Portland chef Sarah Hammon who you might remember from the latest season of Top Chef. I mean, a day off on a boat on the ocean, this is what it's all about. What am I hoping for? Honestly, I'm on a boat, so everything's great. <laughs> <laughs> chef Sarah Hallman and Chef Paul Grossi have never met until today, but they both love fishing. Grossi is head chef at Redfish Restaurant, where diners eat atop the Cape, overlooking the bay and sea stacks of Port Orford, a six-hour drive south of Portland. It's the finest dining with all sustainably caught seafood on the southern Oregon coast, an area you may not be familiar with. But put this spot on your road trip itinerary. Port Orford juts out in the Pacific, the farthest of any point in the state. That means it gets a clash of ocean tides and weather, making for good fishing for these two. Oh, hey, what's up? <laughs> but the way fishing boats get in and out of the water here is something else. Hoisted down onto the ocean by crane using four ropes at each corner. And up here is a good spot. Port Orford is one of only six of these dolly ports in the whole world to do it this way. So my fishing is usually done by the bank off the jetty and everything, so I'm excited to get out here and see what, you know, this has to offer. No, uh, I really want a nice small rockfish. We're going to pair it with a sauce made out of seaweed, and that's a seaweed that we're going to use fresh and that actually is in the waters here. 
South Coast Tours got us all set up. They have the rods and fishing gear for any kind of adventure. I always like to keep my thumb on here. And boy, did it happen quick. How deep are we, Dave? 49. 49? Oh, okay, that's not too bad. All right. I mean, it's... The way... No, that's a fish. Oh, yeah. it's yeah. it. There oh, you yeah. go. Black rock. <laughs> that was easy. That was there great. First there you go. That's <laughs> right. It's whale watching season, and if reeling in plenty of fish doesn't cap off your day, oh, I see it! <laughs> Dang, that's awesome. Spotting two gray whales feeding in the bay certainly will. So let's go ahead and dry this bad boy, which might be hard because it's still moving. <laughs> Just a little bit. That's fresh though. I think rockfish is very versatile. The other great thing about rockfish is that it's incredibly sustainable. There's so much rockfish in the ocean, especially off the Oregon coast. This is a mix of cornmeal, cornstarch, and flour. So we've got some oil heating up here. And just lightly drop it in there. And because our fish is so big, it doesn't fit in the pan. <laughs> okay, plating time. Let's do this. When Chef Paul and I were talking about this dish, we really wanted to make it about the actual rockfish. We got some fresh dulse seaweed. We simmered it together with soy sauce, mirin, rice wine vinegar, a little bit of sugar, and then buzzed it up in the blender. So now we have this really delicious, what I like to call seaweed jam. A little bit sweet, a little bit salty. It's so beautiful. So we've got some cornmeal crusted pan fried rockfish with dulse seaweed jam and an assortment of seasonal pickles and herbs. Now, if you're planning a road trip to Port Orford, that rockfish dish, rockfish dish is a special on the menu at Redfish Restaurant all this week. If you missed the special, though, you can't make it down there in time, you can get rockfish prepared all kinds of ways anytime at the restaurant. So don't worry about that. It's worth a drive down the coast. Nina says there's a lot of camping spots and hiking trails down there, too, to have some fun with. I want to get to a couple questions here. So Mike wrote in and said, how can Portland have influence in four of the six districts? That's proof of gerrymandering, of course, mostly Democrats living in the city of Portland. Um, but you have to remember that all the districts have to have the exact same amount of people in it, down to like one person. It has to be very, very precise. And since Portland is so heavily populated compared to the rest of the state, it's virtually impossible to not use that this bunch of people, this big group of people in Portland, to section up the, the, the rest of the state. It's just the way it has to be drawn. Um, so also, Ernie wrote in and said, hey Dan, uh, do you feel like your reports are starting to fall on deaf ears, that the city leaders aren't really listening to stories like tonight when we talk about Old Town? And no, no, not really. Um, and I don't expect that a bunch of city leaders are sitting around watching this show to try and figure out what to do. I don't expect that. I'm, I'm only ears I'm worried about are your ears. The people at home who are, are the real change makers in, in, in the community, the people who actually are the ones voting when it comes to who is in charge and can, and can make sure that the city goes in the right direction. It's not just the leaders, they're important, right? But it's the people, it's, it's, the, it's the society, the culture here. And, and I want to inform you and let you know what's going on and hear what you want us to report on. That's why we ask you to keep writing into us every night. So I appreciate the people who get engaged. If you're not one of them, please don't be shy. Send us an email. We'll respond or maybe we might even, uh, we might even use your question or comment to build an important segment on this show. That's the story for tonight. I'm Dan Haggerty. I'll see you back here tomorrow.